we're going to talk about radical family and how the small group can in, empower and strengthen the nuclear family. And I have two wonderful women with me today. Uh, Bonnie Blaylock is here with me and um, Katie Frazier is at home. And uh, thank you for joining us, Katie. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and um, I'll tell you a little bit about Bonnie and Katie and then I'll um, introduce the topic. Bonnie holds an MA in English from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And she co-owned a business with her husband for 20 plus years, team taught marriage and family curriculum at church with me <laughs> while raising their two children. And her experiences from this class led her to co-launch the podcast, Just Ask Your Mom, with, with me, me. <laughs> this year. We just launched it. Um, Bonnie and her husband live on a small farm. And when she's not beekeeping or wrangling chickens, she writes personal essays on her blog, BonnieBlaylock.com. And several of her articles, which you guys could, should totally check out, are on Renew.org, Scary Mommy, Grown and Flown, Medium.com, and Ch Chicken Soup for the Soul, and The Blessings of Christmas. She also creates fiction with a debut historical fiction novel to be published in 2022. Yes. I'm so excited. I can't wait to get for it to come out. Excited so to be here. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. And then Katie Frazier, uh, she holds an MA in music from MTSU. And she's taught general music and band full time for nine years and worked as a freelance musician since 2015. Fantastic band director. I heard you before I knew you, Katie, um, at a music event on the square. And I thought, who is that band director? This, this is a high school band. It's supposed to be bad. It was really good. You're so talented. Thank you. She's actively involved in worship ministry at church, and she teaches and trains for Bible study fellowship. She and her husband are raising a daughter and investing in relationships one day at a time, as we all should with small children. <laughs> and she enjoys uh, drinking coffee, snuggling with her dog, Ginger, tending her garden, traveling, and keeping up with Alabama football. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. All right. So, um, yeah, I want to talk about expanding and empowering the nuclear family because in our work with um, the podcast that we've been doing with moms, mm -hmm. this is chronic for women. Like we feel isolated uh, when we're home with our children, even if we're working moms and our children are in school, we feel alone and isolated. And we move away from our families, our extended families, a lot of times. And um, it just puts a lot of strain mm -hmm. on um, the husband and the wife and the children. And there was an article that gave voice to this kind of feeling that we were having. And you shared it with me, I think. Bonnie, oh, David Brooks, mm -hmm. the David Brooks article. And I just want to read um, a quote from it. The title is the nuclear family was a mistake, which is kind of provocative, but um, bear with me here. I want to read this little paragraph. We've made life freer for individuals and more unstable for families. We've made life better for adults, but worse for children. We've moved from big, interconnected, and extended families, which helped protect the most vulnerable people in society from the shocks of life, to smaller, detached, nuclear families, a married couple and their children, which give the most privileged people in society room to maximize their talents and expand their options. The shift from bigger and interconnected families to smaller and detached nuclear families ultimately led to a familial system that liberates the rich and ravages the working class and the poor. He goes on to say that mm -hmm. basically wealthy families can outsource all the help that big extended families once provided. So they can protect and preserve them um, when there's a family crisis, when there's illness, when there's economic hardship, maybe with a job loss, the wealthy can just outsource these um, services, but the rest of us can't. Mm -hmm. And the good news is, um, in a Christian worldview, we are all a family. And if we really take that seriously and dig in and do family together well, we all win. Everybody's vote is raised. So, um, so let's talk about that because you both have lots and lots of experience um, in small groups and living with them as family. Mm -hmm. really treating them as family. So Bonnie, why did you and your husband, Bobby, start that small group that full <laughs> disclosure, my husband and I joined um, way back in what year it was, was 95, it? 1995. 1995. We didn't have children. Right. That was pre-kids. Uh, we had come from uh, University of Tennessee where we had done a small group there uh, with our college group. 
and loved it. We were um, into the deep discussions. You know how you stay up all night long and talk about meaning and all the things. Um, so when we left college and came to start our new married life together in a different place, like you said, we didn't have family close by and we wanted to find our people. So we just signed up on a leaderboard and said, hey, we'll, we'll do it. And whoever wants to join can join. So that's where we met ultimately um, the best friends that we have had and still have here in Murfreesboro. So true. (laughs) So true. I love y'all so much. But so I just signed up on a board to join your group. It's just a random, random random thing. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. And here's the thing, that little tiny house, we didn't care. Like we did not care about this space. Everybody's always worried about was, I don't have the right, I don't have the right house to host and all that. Describe that little house. Barely 900 square feet, maybe, um, with two bedrooms and we fit six families in there, five or six families. And like, you literally could not open the oven door and the back door at the same time. That's how small the kitchen was. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so we just crammed in and started and talking it. about life. I yeah. mean, we just, we use the Bible as our, um, you know, our foundation and just said, let's just talk about this. Let's talk about that. That, Yeah, such great, great memories. All right, Katie, tell me about your experience um, kind of entering small group world. Well, well, Sean and I uh, were part of a small group Bible study in college. And so then when we moved to Murfreesboro, similarly to Bonnie, we wanted to find our people and wanted that same type of discussion group that's difficult in a large Bible class setting, like on a Sunday morning or whatever. And so um, we walked into church the very first Sunday. This was summer of 2007. Didn't know anyone. And someone in the class introduced themselves to us and said, would you like to come to our small group? It's meeting tonight. Here's the time. Here are the details. Yes, we would, you know, and we went and we haven't left since. Um, The original people who were part of that group that we visited that night Uh, The ones who still live here are still in that group. Some have moved to other states, and so we were sad to see them go. But then we've had some new people join us, you know, with those people moving. So the group is not exactly the same as it was in 2007, but um, that's how it happened. We didn't have, you know, like we weren't even official members of the church yet. (laughs) And then we were already in a small group. Yeah, yeah, it's actually a great way to navigate a new big church, isn't it? Like I, I found it to be. Um, you're in a group of a thousand or 1500 and mm-hmm. you've got this small, small group of 10, 15, 20. Okay. So mm-hmm. let's talk about this. Let's talk about how um, small groups differ from D groups. Cause we had talked about, should we mention this? I think it's important to now that I'm hearing your stories because these small groups, they have longevity mm-hmm. um, going for them. So like you just said, Katie, your group is still together, except for the people who've moved away that's your people, but you've also been in D groups, which are more fluid. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me that, can you just reflect on like the pros and cons of each model or like what, what you see um, that you got or or gave in each model? Yes. Uh, My first D group or um, yeah, we'll just call it a small, smaller than small group. (laughs) I don't know if everyone's familiar with that term discipleship group yeah. we usually think of it in terms of three or four people together of the same gender so for me that first one was probably about 2010 I haven't looked at the dates lately but that seems about right and that was just a whole new thing for me um I'm an extrovert. I'm kind of an open book. It doesn't bother me to talk about personal things so it wasn't difficult for me in that way but what was difficult is uh, making sure to have the time scheduled. And when we were studying particular, sometimes we did books, sometimes we studied just passages from the scripture, but making sure I was prepared basically. And so I would say that's a difference besides the, the makeup of the small group in our experience at first was couples with no kids, like you said, Bonnie, and then over time people started having children or adopting children. Um, but anyway, the D group, is supposed to stay small and it's just of the same gender so that's besides that uh, aspect with a small group you mostly just show up 
and you're discussing and praying things in the current moment, sort of on the fly. Sometimes people are in crisis. And so you're, you know, you're right in there in the trenches with them, or you're studying along with the sermon series at church. And so you just heard it that morning. So there's not really a lot of prep work, at least in our experience with our small group, but the D group was different in that it was more of some preparation. Um, what about the we'll, timeline for your D group? Like how long did y'all meet? My first group met for about two years and the second one was shorter. I think it was about a, between a year and a year and a half. And the last one was about a year. And that one wrapped up, um, actually it overlapped with the adoption of our daughter. And we tried to continue on through Zoom after that. <laughs> it was really tough. So uh, I don't know, I guess it depends on what everybody's got going on, but I'd say between one and two years is pretty much the average. Yeah, and your and the goals, seem somewhat different to me, at least in the ones that I've been involved in, where you're, um, you're, you're looking for certain markers of growth and maturity, some, some level of accountability, and it's kind of accelerated, where like small groups are the long play, because uh, you're just going to be doing life together, you know, for the foreseeable future. Would you say that's your experience or, or something different? I agree. And, you know, if we can just be totally transparent about this, some D groups that I was in, as I try to keep it all very generic, um, you become aware that someone's not willing to change or mature. And at that point, it's like, okay, you know, and so I'll, there's a lot of different ways that you'll know when it's time. I think it's not just that yay, we've all reached spiritual maturity. Next. <laughs> I mean, seriously, yeah. sometimes it's yeah. because of not, not having progress, not willingness to go deep or be transparent or whatever it is. Um, but I do think after the three different ones, you kind of get more of a sense of, okay, this feels like it's wrapping up. We've, you know, ready, y'all are ready to actually lead. Like, let's do this, you know? <laughs> yeah, that replicatable kind yes. of model. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. other, other thoughts about the differences between a D group and a small group, benefits, drawbacks. Your husband has done a lot of them with he has. younger men. And I think it's just like what Katie was saying. It's a, you start from the beginning with a time limit or understanding of we're going to do this for a year. Yeah. Here are the topics we're going to discuss. Is everyone willing to jump right in and be transparent and vulnerable? And there's kind of a, not a con contract, but you know, kind an of. unspoken yeah. contract between the members of the group. But the smaller group, it seems more fluid. It's more, um, you're just doing life together. You're just, this is going to be our people. You're free to leave. I mean, it's not a cult. <laughs> you're not trapped in there. Um, and people did leave ours for yeah. various reasons, like yeah. you said, moving out of town or whatever. Um, and of course you're there to help everybody, but I, I think there's a personality to groups too. It just, mm -hmm. um, our group happened to have a lot of introverts in it. So it was going to take us a really long like time years before <laughs> we all were comfortable enough to open up, you know, by the time we met week to week, yes. um, some other groups like Katie's an extrovert. So they're going to jump right in and yes. tell you every, you know, oversharing we or whatever. We need Katie's <laughs> you do, to, we didn't have, to get us going. We didn't have that mix. <laughs> so I think there's different purposes and different personalities of yeah. groups too. And that might lead you to when and where you need to stop. Right, it. right. Um, so yeah, I agree. And I, it, as an introvert, it, um, it makes me all twitchy and twingy, quick cringy inside to think about like the, um, the constant rollover. Mm -hmm. of, of, um, new groups and like digging in because like, I only have so much bandwidth for a certain amount of people in my life. And so I think we need to be aware of that uh -huh. and just know like what our pace can be. Cause you were doing it, girl. Kate, I'm pointing at you, Katie, like you were doing, <laughs> like you were doing one and then you were doing yeah. another and <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> yes. I'll just say, you know, like you're talking about, it's the season of life and yeah. we were waiting to become parents. And so we had more time. Mm -hmm. It's different for me now. Mm -hmm. So it's just your yeah. season of life. And, and I do think you have to pay attention to boundaries for your own family, your own marriage and your own relationship with God. I think it's possible to be in too many godly activities and you're not with God. So you do have to pay attention to that for each individual person. I think even if you look at Christ's example, he's got the 12, which is a yeah. bigger group, a small group, if mm -hmm. you will. And then he's got some closer ones that he pulls mm -hmm. out and says, okay, James, John, you guys are going to be my, 
D group. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we're going to get closer and go a little bit deeper mm -hmm. in a quicker time. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, let's, let's turn back to small groups. Let's think about um, specifically, because for me, I think sometimes like um, specific examples can be helpful. And so in David Brooks's article, he said, you know, the, the big extended family helped people weather the shocks of life. Mm -hmm. And so I know our group has weathered some shocks mm -hmm. of life. I'm assuming that your group has probably weathered some shocks of life because that's the world we live in. Um, what, what was that like? Uh, what do you, I, I'm interested to hear what you observed because we haven't talked, mm -hmm. but we know some of the shocks of life that happened. Um, what was the benefit for the families? How did we navigate it? Well, maybe we didn't mm -hmm. navigate it so well. <laughs> Right. Well, if it's a couples group, there's going to be um, marriage issues that come up um, or don't come up if they choose not to share it. And I think that was part of that was a weakness of ours is that um, maybe we didn't ask specifically. <laughs> um, like if you notice some red flags or some issues, um, I think we probably could have done that better going mm -hmm. maybe not in a large group setting, but same gender people going to the wife or the husband or whatever and kind of getting deeper with them. I think we could have done that better and maybe mended some of the fractures, maybe. Yeah, I agree with you. I um, I know who she's talking about and um, I was helping one of their children, their grandchildren fill out a resume and it was for a church job. Mm -hmm. So she had to do a testimony and in her description of her childhood, we had no idea mm -hmm. what was going on and that you're right. Like we didn't ask the right questions right. and we, we, I suspected but I did the very American thing and like minded my own business. Uh -huh. And I think that was a failing. I, that was immaturity on my part oh, sure. um, I mean, or we just too. worldly thinking. Um, but yeah, I, I, that would have, could have possibly been mm -hmm. something could've. that could have gone a different, a different way. Um, and there was, there were others, but let's, yeah. let's let Katie answer and then I'll let you sure. do another one. Katie, what about you all? Well, I've made a quick list. Um, I don't know all the background of everyone who will listen to this or read this article, but just some things to consider. We've had several people in our group change jobs, some radical changes that required going back to school, getting different degrees and some very hard times through that transition and others just shifting to a different company or whatever. But there's been lots of job changes in 14 years, as you can imagine. Uh, infertility, several different families have walked through that different you know, specifics, but that's come up. Um, health con concerns, whether it's like something in the physical body or more of a mental, uh, emotional thing that people have dealt with. We've had loss of parents and loss of siblings in our group. Wow. Um, people learning how to deal with their aging parents. And most of our group is like 30s and 40s age. So, you know, the parents, some of them are, are getting on up there. And when we first started, no one was, was doing that. But now 14 years later, some of us are. And then I'll say one failing um, that God is redeeming, but it was hard for us to integrate new families. And there's two specific situations I'm thinking of that, you know, you have regret about it's in the past. So you can't just dwell on, on that. But um, I think that the shocks of life, when those people, we were trying to integrate them and not doing well, not connecting. And then when they left, everybody felt like it was a failure. And that was just kind of a shock to the group. Almost like, are we doing this right? I mean, like, what are we doing if we can't even welcome new people? Mm -hmm. So some things were experienced in, in, you know, individual families, but then some things were experienced as the whole group. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. We, I think we felt the same things. Mm -hmm. Um, your whole list, I think we could have gone through the same thing, just, just the same way. We we're all having children around the same time. So I can remember us um, just as young moms, like, how did you do this? Like, <laughs> we're all nursing during the Bible studies. We're all just doing life stuff yeah. together and yeah. meeting socially outside of that too, because as you get closer, you're, you're doing outside the group things too. Um, one of our biggest shocks was when we lost somebody in the group um, that well, he lost his wife and we lost our, one of our really close friends and the kids lost their mom and mm -hmm. how you navigated that as a group. And I, I'd say that would, um, that was kind of an earthquake to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, she was way too young and we didn't really know what to do with all that. Um, but I think we helped, we helped the family as best that we knew yeah. how to do at the time. Yeah. We did what we knew. Um, 
which sure is what was... like you did lots of things like you guys did lots of things we were we had moved away um and so we were watching this from afar and would obviously come when we visited and see mm-hmm. everybody but like doctor's appointments and yeah haircuts um, and um we have we would have to sit with her she had cancer i'd sit with her during the day and during someone would stay with her at night we would go over and like help her shower help her eat brush her teeth um you know everything yeah all personal care to a deep deep level um and the boys and they were at your house and other people's houses Mm -hmm. and um, other moms kind of came along, right. School and, yeah. and whatever mm-hmm. they needed, we were doing round the clock prayer. We were doing round the clock care, um, whatever they needed. And, and even to the end. Yeah. I was there when another she died. Friend was there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was mm-hmm. just really, I mean, just as a life thing was really hard to figure out and navigate and live through. But, um, yeah. And then just because of what grief does to you, I think that family kind of pulled pulled away from our group just you just do things that you need to do to get through it and um it was after that point I think that just life got busy and kids got older and as you're if you have lots of children in the group sometimes the children don't as they age they don't all get along as they used to when they were two and three and just the fabric the dynamic changes yeah so yeah it does seasons it, of things. it does <laughs> um so you're in it for the long haul 14 years. I mean, you're, you for the foreseeable future, this is your family. Do you consider them family? I mean, Hebrews 11 kind of describes us that way. You know, we have all these ancestors who did all these amazing things there. Those are our people. Those yes. are our spiritual family, our ancestors. Um, is that how you see your group? Yes, I totally agree. And I was thinking today, whenever there's something going on, whether it's big or small, my small group ladies are the first ones that I text. We're just in a perpetual group text and everybody understands that somebody may not be able to respond right there in that moment. Um, if you just get a, a double tapped heart or whatever, <laughs> it doesn't mean they don't care, but they might be at work or dealing with some situation with a child or whatever, and they'll cycle circle back, you know, and, and get back with you. But I just have total confidence that they're keeping us in prayer. They know of some ongoing things that really no one else knows about, maybe outside of some of our immediate family members. And I just trust them. You know, Um, it has taken a long time. I won't say it's taken all 14 years to reach that point, but it takes a long time to build that type of trust and people who know your backstory. You don't have to go into the details every time. And we just don't have many other friends like that. Mm -hmm. So yes, I do consider them my long haul people. Mm -hmm. Long answer. (laughs) So, so can let's, let's circle back to um, when you said you didn't maybe integrate a new family. Well, because we had, we had the same experience. Yep. Um, Did you learn some lessons you could share with people who are trying to like, when you've been together a long time, you've got all this inside jokes and history and all the thing, you know, it's hard to come in. Are there things we can do to, to not be totally closed? as groups when there's space that becomes available? This is a really hard question and I would welcome y'all to throw in whatever you're thinking as well. Um, the two that I think about in, in, on this topic, it was really hard because as you mentioned, one or two families had recently moved. So we did have the space, you know, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. Um, most American homes have plenty of space, but y'all know what I mean. And the personalities in both of these cases, just right off the bat, were very different than the rest of the group. Um, there wasn't an easy conversation. There wasn't um, people just jumping in and trying to like, you know, go with it. <laughs> and so I'm not trying to place the blame on the other people, but we weren't equipped to know how to help them feel comfortable or what are some activities we could do that would be like, you know, bonding or whatever to just maybe take a time out on our regular thing and try to help them. We just didn't have those tools. And so we're just kind of carrying on with our normal thing with praying and Bible study and good things, you know, but it was like just very frustrating for all parties involved. Um, One of them left kind of on hurtful terms and then another one just kind of faded away and I remained in contact for a while, but it was like, okay, I guess they're done. I mean, so to pass along any helpful information, I guess maybe reach out if you sense that is happening with the new family or couple or whatever, um, reach out for someone who's been walking that 
small group journey longer than you. If you have someone at your church or whatever as a resource, um, definitely do that. We didn't. And so there you go. Um, But I will say this newest family that joined us last year during the pandemic of all times, like literally we were meeting on Zoom and this new family just jumped right in. Um, I will say, I think it's been a lot easier because they did, you know, for right from the get go, they made it a priority to be there. And so their personalities are more similar to ours. So that's another thing that has helped. And I'm not trying to say you have to have our personality be in our group, but I just mean that that makes it faster, faster for them to get plugged in. So to anyone listening, if you sense that it's their personalities are quite different or they seem very hesitant to share or whatever, then you may have to get some extra help on how can we help them, you know, plug in better. Uh, do we need to take a time out from what we're doing and focus more on like team building type of stuff? And so as a teacher, you know, thinking of it in those terms, it makes sense. But in the moment, you know, you're just thinking about small group and, oh, we're in the middle of this great study and <laughs> come on in, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's my that's, two cents. That's, that's wise. That's good. That's helpful and very real life. I mean, as you said, groups have personality. Right. And in any kind of family, your own like immediate family, that happens too. You have, you know, the great aunt that doesn't really fit so great at Thanksgiving. <laughs> and, you know, there's that one brother that gets on your nerves, but it's, you're still a family. You can yeah. still make it work. Yeah. Um, one, I think really helpful thing that we've done in several of our groups is um, to tell your spiritual story. And, um, that may be only two people at a time, you know, per meeting, get to do it because it takes a long time and requires people to kind of walk through their life. Here's my significant spiritual events in my life and otherwise, and you just sort of get to know without telling every detail. Um, you get to know each other model pretty quickly it, that right. way. You would, you would model it. Right. You and Bobby, go like, first. okay, here's the length we're looking for. Here's the number yeah. of events we're looking for, which mm-hmm. as you get older, it's harder. <laughs> Pick five from 50 years instead of five from 30 years. Right. <laughs> the condensed version. Yeah. The Reader's yeah. Digest version. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, that really helps people sort of, oh, okay. Now I know where you're coming from. I get kind of who you are. And then some of Katie's tips too, on top of that, to just yeah. take a break and be like, we're just going to get to know y'all for a little while. Mm-hmm. I think that that it's, it's, it works like magic because <laughs> it's not magic. It's, it's God's Holy spirit, mm-hmm. you know, working through you and your story mm-hmm. and it, it's create, it does like before your eyes, create a family. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's wild. You're crossing that vulnerability bridge, which is so hard to get across. Yes. You think there's trolls underneath it and everything else, but it's the, it's the thing that makes your group gel is yeah. to tell about yourself, to be open and honest and to yeah. share. And it's only fair for a new family to hear everybody else's like, you don't just make them do this. Right. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> yeah. You need to go, but you would have to take a pause. Like you said, Katie, from this real cool stu- study that you're doing to like, okay, now we're going to take some time to like mm-hmm. make this go back again. Yeah. Go back again. And, and I think that's super wise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really, mm-hmm. really helpful. Um, all right. So let's talk about some Puritans. <laughs> I love the Puritans. They have so much wisdom for us today. And um, as I was researching for this conversation, I found this cool article. A lady uh, named Joan Jung or Jung Jung wrote a godly conversation, rediscovering the Puritan practice of conference. And she said that there's some good habits they had that we could learn from each other. And I'm going to describe this to you. And then I want you to tell me if you think you've done this in your group or if you think it would be helpful or whatever. All right, the English Puritans are rarely remembered as being communal, but they were. Their meeting in groups small enough to afford our doings before men would be their equivalent to our contemporary small group, but with clear differences. The rediscovery of the Puritan practice of holy conference is relevant and timely. Conference was the type of intentional conversation sparked by particular questions that Puritans practiced with one another when meeting in small numbers. Okay, did we do that? Hmm. Did we have, part- I think Bobby used to ask us particular questions. He did, I, my husband is, he's the one that sort of traditionally always let it because he just loves, that's his thing, he loves mm-hmm. to do it. So um, he is a big, big fan of the question mm-hmm. and he, and the subsequent pause. So a lot of leaders <laughs> will, um, Mm-hmm. they get uncomfortable if there's any kind of silence in the group or some members do too. And they have to have all the right answers. 
Um, but he's not afraid to just sort of ask this question. It could be a really awkward, uncomfortable one or something you've never thought of before and just sort of let it sit there in the room, which is like this, okay, the spirit is stirring. Um, mm-hmm. What are you really thinking about? Let's, let's get uncomfortable for a minute. And then and he won't speak until someone else comes up with an answer. He doesn't have to plug in the answer. Um, and I think that's kind of what you're talking about. Yes. It's not yes. just, you know, who's your favorite Bible character? God <laughs> and Jesus. No, it's like real deep yeah. questions. I'm thinking think like about. one of our first um, studies that we walked through was the bondage breaker. It was, um, Holy spirit, really like heavy Holy spirit stuff, which was radical it was for me a, at that time in my life for a younger as Christians. a 20 something year old. <laughs> and yeah, he would ask these kind of questions. And I would like, like he said one time, like, how, how do you know someone's a Christian? What's the mark of a Christian? And we all sat there <laughs> and we were like, well, <laughs> right. <laughs> But, and he's not, he's, I think I would say humble enough to be teachable too. Yeah. Like he's not saying I've got the answers. He's like, you tell me, we need to figure this out together. Mm -hmm. That's what this is about. Yeah. So to be humble enough as a leader to step out of the way for a minute too. It really is. It's, it's really fabulous to have a leader like that. What about y'all, Katie? Well, I was thinking about when we did our discussion time based on the DBS model where you say, you know, what does this passage say about God? What does it say about people? What changes do you need to make or who needs to hear this truth? All those questions, you know, it was the same questions week in and week out. And so in that sense, obviously that was very intentional to keep you tied to the Bible, but the passage that you're studying. Um, And that's, that's what the purpose was. Obviously you're supposed to accompany that with prayer And so I would say another thing is just the intentional ongoing conversation about prayer requests, you know, checking up with people. We always have a time of prayer in our life group. Maybe, I don't know, once in a blue moon, the discussion time goes long or there's some kind of crisis going on with the children. (laughs) Um, That that may not happen. (laughs) (laughs) We're just keeping it real, people. Um, (laughs) Anyway, but as I said, you know, we know what's going on in each other's lives. And so the intentionality comes in with how's it going with this? You know, you mentioned this last week. What's the update on, you know, fill in the blank. Um, But I will say, I think a weakness for us with intentional conversation is specific questions about people's marriages. And we could talk about all kinds of reasons for that. But throwing it out to the entire small group at this just how's your marriage is probably not the best way to do it. And so even like on a group text is probably not the best way either. So there's been times where we've gotten together, just the women and, you know, the men separately, those are hard to to do. I'm just being honest. It's hard to schedule those times. We tried doing it one time while we were meeting. So we had the women in one room, the men in another room, the children in another room. And it was kind of short lived. So maybe we should try that again. But um, I think that's an important intentional question that we should be asking. And we just haven't found a good consistent way to do it, just to yeah. be honest. Yeah. And I we didn't even talk logistics. You have a sitter, right? That comes. Well, we have 10 children ranging in age from three to almost 10. So we have two, it's a brother and sister that come actually. And um, it's a wonderful setup. Most of the time they're in the backyard, which we have a fenced in backyard. And so it's great, you know, let them run and play and be kids. Um, But occasionally the weather gets, you know, that all messed up. So we do have a bonus room in our home. And so they're in there, but there's no door. So talking about the logistics, we can hear everything. Like when they're in the bonus room, we hear every little squabble, every correction, every whining moment and we all know our child's voices so we know who's (laughs) saying it (laughs) so it can be very distracting in that way um but it's still the best that we can do and so we just make it work but yeah yeah, trying to have three separate rooms in the house that that's gets tough and you always meet at your house we are the the permanent hosts yeah we always met at ours too and you do you all chip in to pay the sitter Yes. Uh, what we've agreed upon is each family pays $5 per child. 
And so then, you know, the, the mother of the two children has Venmo. So you can just Venmo the money right when life group is over and occasionally people forget. But anyway, <laughs> then the mother can distribute between the two children, you know, and then we don't have to worry about if it's like somebody needs 50 cents over here and 50 cents over there. The mom kind of works that out. Yeah, that's that's really that's great. And then we did a different way. You want to describe the way we, we did it? Gosh, if I can remember, we didn't have a sitter. We had older Mm -hmm. kind of the older kids were looking after the younger kids. Um, and if you had babies that could stay in the group with you mm -hmm. and actually a time or two after our group had kind of dissipated and run its season, we met again and had some of the older kids in on our group as adults, mm -hmm. which is a neat, um, transition yeah, to my other thing, but, yeah. uh, yeah, we would just put the kids to bed mm -hmm. at a certain point And that we, was it. We started late. So like we came over like seven o'clock mm -hmm. and we hung out and you kept it simple, simple, maybe a pan of brownies. Like it was not entertaining. No, it, was it wasn't just really very social. casual life. Mm -hmm. So seven o'clock to eight, we all kind of got our talking, chatting in the kids played. And then at eight, we put them down to bed, put them to bed in the bathtubs on the floor, literally in the bathtubs, uh -huh. which they loved. Like who, <laughs> like that's a treat going to sleep in the bathtub and on the beds and all that. And then at eight o'clock we started. Right. And we'd go till and that was from the time they, all of them were babies. So they just mm -hmm. learned, this is the way we do it on Tuesday mm -hmm. night. Yeah. We just trained them to sleep and they, did where they needed to sleep. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was just a choice. So that's another way. Like, mm -hmm. so there's a lot, there's a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to help our viewers know that you, you can be creative to make this work. We were just committed right. every other Tuesday. We were committed. That's mm -hmm. what, that's what we did. And there was a lot of times we were there till 10, 11, the and kids were asleep, they'd carry them out sleeping. And I mean, like that was, yeah. And that we, and we would save like more, we call, call it dessert. If we really wanted to go in depth mm -hmm. into something, we just waited till the group was done. And then that kept us on track. Right. It was always, we would meet for an hour mm -hmm. and we would say, okay, after an hour, we're technically done. If you, if you need to leave, leave, but mm -hmm. then we're going to, you want to stay for a dessert, yes. extra topics, whatever. We'll yeah. do that too. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so, so, um, so, okay. So, and I've got one more Puritan, um, thing I want to touch on, but I don't want to, I don't want us to end before we talk about like stage two of small groups, yeah. because there's lots of different seasons of life. And I, I think it's critical for your season of life, Katie, what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I just think the nuclear family needs all the help it can get. And we need like-minded people in our world. We need older people as well in our world. And so describe what you and your husband are doing now mm -hmm. in the season of life. We're, we're empty nesters. Yep. Our kids are gone. Yep. Um, and we decided we kind of looked around at church because we had our people, we had our times like, well, where's the need now? And it turned out to be the new fledgling young marrieds that didn't have their people. They just like us, mm -hmm. they had just left college and they were kind of trying to find their group. They didn't have children. So we said, we'll just start one for the young marrieds. And Lo and behold, Renee's son and daughter-in-law are in it. <laughs> I'm so thrilled. It's and such it's a blessing. It's been the coolest thing oh. because he was one of the babies in the bathtub from the very beginning. And now he's mm -hmm. um, in our small group of young marrieds and it's just blowing my mind, but <laughs> so cool. They're yeah. teaching us so much and um, just kind of remembering this is what it was like to be newlyweds and all that as much as we're teaching them and it's fabulous to see they have bonded so quickly and gotten their friends and their people so fast. Yes. Um, yes. So yay! I'm so happy. And I know it's beautiful. <laughs> like they're gonna have, they're gonna have it. They're gonna have each other. I see it like coming down the yep. road. But what did you all do to help them? Because I, I know that didn't just happen. They're all different, very different personalities. Mm -hmm. So what did y'all do to kind of help those roots go down fairly quickly? We did the spiritual stories. Mm -hmm. um, we did because they're young marrieds. Um, we started talking about marriage first because that's where they were at. Yeah. Um, and now each of them, they're not all starting at the same place. Some of them are deep thinkers. Some of them are, um, you know, let's go have fun. We want to do something social. So you got to incorporate all of that. Sometimes we'll have a meal. Sometimes we won't. Um, but we did our spiritual stories and then we did a lot of, um, you might call it team building, but we meant it for their individual marriages. But we found out each, everybody's spiritual gifts everybody's personalities, everybody's, um, you know, their different temperaments and things like that. So in getting to know each other as husband and wife, we were also getting to know everybody as a group. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty cool. And, you, and your parent, like you already were for our son, a parent figure, but um, you're becoming parent figures for these people. I mean, that you're 
We're their parents' age. Oh, we are. <laughs> it's kind of weird when they're calling so, you Miss Bonnie. Or I whatever, know, but... ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, but some of them who are here from out of town, they, their parents aren't here. We yeah. took them a meal last night because they're both sick, you know, and they're just like, oh, this is what we would have asked our mom and dad to do. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's that's the point. This like, is that's this the is point. it. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. the shocks of life. That's doing life together. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, it's so great. I just, I, I think we're missing it. If you're not doing it, like get yourself a small group, get it, like make it happen. Mm -hmm. Ask the Lord to show you, like, show me how we can make this happen or check Mm -hmm. out with your church what's going on. Um, it's so critical. Yeah. I had family in town and 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 felt like it was critical. It's not a, another to-do list thing. It really is a gosh, a blessing. Yes. The biggest blessing of your life to have your people, to have somebody call at 3 AM or someone you call when you get that diagnosis. Like you were saying, Katie, um, you just, yeah. you need those people in your life. We're not meant to do it alone. I look at it as like an investment, you know, every mm-hmm. time you're with your group, you're making an investment in their lives. They're making an investment in your life and not to make it so transactional, but you never know when you're going to need to withdraw mm-hmm. something from that investment that you've made, that you're going to be the needy one. And you never know when other people are going to need you, um, So it's just always an investment. You're investing in each other, investing in your own marriage and family. Um, I just look at it as a huge investment. And I mean, it's a joy. Like you said, it's such a blessing and things that happen. You go, oh my word. It's not like random, but at the moment you think it is. And then you go, wow, God's handprint is all over this. So it's just an amazing thing to look back. And so I try to be aware in the moment when things happen too, but, um, yeah, give it some time is what I'm trying to say. Give, give your group effort some time to have that common ground of, um, Christ and the family, the church family, um, is so critical too, because even if you do have family nearby, uh, they may be completely, you know, of a different worldview than you. That's, that was my case. So, um, I needed people who shared that, Christ family who shared that worldview and, and that way of walking through life, um, to sharpen me mm-hmm. and vice versa. Uh, cause I just, I couldn't get that from my work friends. I didn't get that from my necessarily my immediate family even. Um, so you just need that. We do. We do. And I had to, um, lay down and repent of the idea of, um, like paying people back. So in small groups, so if they did something for me, like, okay, feeling like I need to do something for them or write them a note, thank them. Like, no, like God means for us to be indebted to one another and mm-hmm. love, let no debt remain outstanding, mm-hmm. except the debt to love one another. Mm-hmm. And so that is how we are supposed to be doing life. I think of it in terms of my mom, you know, when my mom does something for me, I should thank her, but it's just because she's my mom. I mean, it's just, that's what moms do. And so the same way in Mm -hmm. our small group, that's what brothers and sisters do for each other, you Mm -hmm. know, cousins, aunts, uncles, that's what we do for each other. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's such, to me, it's such a, um, it's a magnetic thing to the world, you know, to see happiness, to see harmony, to see community where people are starved for it. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a super easy, clear, bright bridge for the gospel, mm-hmm. you know, when, when people are like, what do you, how do you have that? What do you, I want what you have. Then you can just, right. That, there's your opening mm-hmm. right there mm-hmm. for the gospel. All right. We're getting close on time. I want to, um, I want to, uh, touch on one more thing from the Puritans. Um, there's a few questions that they used in particular when they did conference. And, uh, one of these you touched on Katie, um, what does God want you to know about him and about yourself? Which is that, what does that passage tell you about God? And what, is, what do I need to change for? What is the soul thankful? What are you thankful for? What words or actions um, demonstrate your soul's love for Christ? What are your words and actions that would demonstrate your love for Christ? Um, what are you afraid of knowing about God or being known by God? And what stands between you and God? <laughs> That sounds like a conversation killer to me. <laughs> hey, Bonnie, what is standing between you and God today? <laughs> Let me just tell you. I mean, they are, they are pretty savage. I mean, uh, I think that's I think that's a really 
even to try to get there would be a win. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We, we always talk about intentionality. Mm-hmm. You might not actually get there, but you're, if you're aiming, mm-hmm. um, if you're aiming for it, um, you're going to do better. Did yeah. we do that? Did we ask these kinds of questions? I, some of them. Yes. That last one, probably not as much. We weren't necessarily as accountable or confessional mm-hmm. to one another as we probably could have been. I wasn't. <laughs> I mean, with my life crisis, I was, I remember sitting in groups yes. that night and like telling you all everything that was going on, but maybe just like another episode, we're not going to go into all that, <laughs> but just the day to day. It's not like, yeah, hey, I was prideful today. Yes. I was, you know, right. snappy. I was all these things. Did we No, I didn't do that. Yeah. I didn't do that. Do y'all do that, Katie? I think the group text is probably a big difference between when you guys, no offense, were in a group together. <laughs> like, <in> the <laughs> I don't think you're all calling each other on the phone multiple times throughout the day, but just, <laughs> like, I can just yeah. zip a text and say, I am really struggling with anger today. Mm. You know, not everyone does that every day or even every week, but it is something we talk about from time to time. Um, the struggles that we're facing that are preventing relationship and maybe it doesn't come out in terms of between me and God, but we all know that that's definitely a key part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think it does happen periodically. We don't I talk about it in person when we're all together for small group, but I do think the group text facilitates that. That's a wise like take that home, do mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. use that tool. Um, mm-hmm. my, my young mom's D group does that a lot. Um, we have a group text and, um, if someone's struggling with something in motherhood, they'll put it up there and we can mm-hmm. get on it in prayer right mm-hmm. then. And a lot of times, um, if we like some of your busy moms, so sometimes you just like, are, I'm praying, but sometimes if you've got time to like we got one girl who loves to voice memo. Bless her. She's the best. She'll like say prayer right then, like on the voice memo and you can just play it and, and hear it. And, you know, we'll pray over each other in that way. I and I, that. I think you mentioned that you did that some Katie. Do you do that? Yeah. With your group? Like you, you have a, you have a method cause you're a busy young mom. Well, yeah, I think we were talking about that recently that mm-hmm. sometimes I know that I need to have a good response more than got it. And yeah. so sometimes I choose to wait until I have a good moment that I can think clearly. Um, I like sending scriptures as an encouragement. And a lot of times the Holy spirit brings one to mind for that specific situation, but I want to make sure that I look it up and that it's correct. And sometimes in the moment, I I can't do all that, those steps. So it might be a few hours later, but I do really enjoy sending scripture or writing out a prayer. I don't think I've done the voice memo prayer, but that's a great idea. They can hear your voice. So all the extroverts love it. (laughs) Our extrovert does it. Like she's definitely the extrovert of the group. Um, yeah. And I'm thinking of Susanna Wesley. I think it was her, she who um, would throw her apron over her head in her kitchen. She had like a ton of kids and like get on her knees and throw her apron over her head and pray in her kitchen. I'm just like, I can see us like throwing a blanket over ourselves on the <laughs> sofa and like texting a prayer really, really fast. <laughs> so, okay. So in closing, um, like how, is there any kind of parting word you'd like to say to people in terms of, um, how to do small group well, what, um, would you encourage them? If you had to decide between a small group and a D group, like what would you, how would you choose? What parameters would you choose? Cause you know, different seasons of life, different things. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you like to say, Katie? That was a lot of questions, Renee. I'm trying to, well, any of them, the I'm not, you'll answer all of them. I'm just thinking any final, any final thoughts? Well, I was thinking about leadership of a small group. We haven't talked about that very much. Bonnie, you mentioned your husband enjoying the questions, but like when we started, we were not the leaders. We were members of the small group. And then the people who were leaders had to step down. And so we became the leaders Mm -hmm. and we hadn't had any training. We didn't attend a seminar. We didn't read a book. I mean, it was just like, we knew what they'd been doing before. So we just kind of picked up the torch and carried on. And I will say, you know, my husband's an introvert and when we're in the mixed group, he does usually more of the talking just to keep conversations going and whatnot. Um, 
y'all know I don't, I'm not afraid to speak up, but anyway, he hadn't had a lot of training as far as that goes. And so I've loved watching him grow into leading the life group and how to wait, like you mentioned, Bonnie, um, how to ask follow-up questions. And I'm just trying to encourage anybody listening. We weren't equipped with all those skills in the beginning. Um, there were some things about the small group, you know, that we weren't super happy with, but we didn't know how to change it. And so it just took some time. So I'm just trying to encourage anybody out there. Don't feel like you have to be totally trained, yeah, know yeah. all the answers before you agree to lead or co-lead, whatever it looks like. Um, and just be patient with whoever is the leader. Like they said yes to that, which is awesome. And give them some time to figure it out and see how you can encourage them. It's really amazing to see how that can develop over the years. So that's, that's my two cents that we hadn't <laughs> talked about yet. Yeah, that's great. Okay, Bonnie? I would say periodically um, check in on your individual people. If, if you're closer to one than another one, then that's fine. You know, get with your individual people. But also if there's been prayer requests during the week or some crisis going on, um, don't just say, well, we only meet on Tuesdays and the rest of the week, I'm not allowed to sort of say anything. Keep that relationship going. Um, and then also as a group, check in when you meet occasionally, maybe every quarter or so, like, how are we doing as a group? What do you guys need from us that you're not getting? Or um, maybe do we want to do something outside of us, a service thing or something like that? Is this personality of our group okay? Do we need to add anyone? Um, just take the pulse of your group every now and then. Oh, that's great. That's, that's Can I say something on the service thing too? I'm glad yeah. you said that, Bonnie, because I had that written down and I forgot about it. Over the years, we've done different things with that, and COVID has prevented a lot of things that we would like to have done over the last, you know, 17 months or so. Um, but I think that was a really great thing to open it up to the group and say, are you aware of any needs? Someone in your life, your work, your somebody at church that didn't put it on the, you know, church-wide <laughs> bulletin or prayer requests. Are there any needs that we can help with? And sometimes people can help and sometimes they can't. And we've done a number of different things over the years, but it's sad for a while. It's, it's been kind of like delivering meals to people is the only thing we can really do. So that's, that's kind of sad, but um, I anticipate getting some more opportunities as we go along. But I do think doing things for other people outside the group is important just to remember that it's not all about us. Mm -hmm. And doing it with the children involved, I think is key. Um, if at all possible, bring the kids along. So I'm glad you brought up service because I think that needs to be an active part of small groups. Yeah, such a such a beautiful way of life. It is a beautiful way to do life. It reminds me a lot of the passage in Acts too, where it talks about, you know, there was no needy persons among them. Everyone shared and they met together daily and mm -hmm. um so as much as possible, we do, we want to live out um, that we want to be that tangible family of God, that big, extended, beautiful family. And small groups is a really great way to do that. There's mm -hmm. pitfalls along the way. There's things you can do to be wise about it. There's clever things you can do to make it work with 10 kids under 10. <laughs> <laughs> but um, life is big and messy anyway. So um, just be blessed. Go, go find you a small group. And, um, or start one, start one of your own <laughs> and yeah. And go live out the family of God. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Bonnie, Katie. Thank you. I, I just love you guys. And, um, really appreciate you giving the time nap time for you, Katie, precious time. So we really appreciate that. Um, thank You're you for welcome. joining us and we'll see you next time for, um, our D.org radical series.